to, let's get straight back into it and finish up making this part. Now it's time to make some steady pins, again from cast yellow brass. trap a lot of restorers fall into is to assume th some things through habit. The norm in horology is to have steel steady pins in the brass part. This however is not an open down this part. Here's an original part and you can clearly see the brass steady pins as fitted by the maker. It's also extremely easy to make out the scratch and scrape or file marks from the original manufacture. These parts will be hidden from view when the clock is assembled, but I like to take care with the detail and to notice things like this as much as I can. Here I'm replicating the marks with a coarse file. It's possible to file very flat when holding a part like this if care is taken to feel the bite of the file. The steady pins can then be hammered home and peened over before filing the heads flush. Again, looking at the original features of the clock, we can see the steady pins are flush with the plate. So the last stage is to file the new ones down to match.
Now I cut a fresh template and glue it into position to give me a rough line to cut and file to. I then cut the shape with a piercing saw. The shapes then refined by hand with a series of files. When finished with the template, the bond of the glue can be broken by soaking the part in acetone for a few minutes. Next, the location of the pivot hole needs to be found. There are several ways that this could be done, but with the front plate of a much smaller size than the back plate, the clock is a little trickier to hold. I fit the part to the clock and with the aid of some blue dicom I mark the horizontal line at the centre height. I use a surface plate and a height gauge to take the height from the pivot hole on the front plate and transfer it to the new part. The tricky bit is the horizontal location. I found this again using the front plate as a guide, but this time I transferred it using a precarious setup of engineer's squares clamped together to give me a marking guide. Sometimes the job itself takes but a moment, but to get to that moment you must spend quite a bit of time setting up. With the crosshairs now marked, giving the location for a centre part punch mark to be drilled for a pivot hole at the later stage. Another template is cut and glued on as an aid to sawing and filing the upper section of the top.
The whole part is then refined with files and papers to give a reasonable finish. It's now time to look again at the original parts, this time to get a good idea of the size and style of the decorative bevels that need to be filed. I use my dividers to gauge the size of the bevels on the original parts before using them to mark the new part. This gives me a set of lines to file to, and the bevels can now be filed in by hand. The final stage is to use a selection of finer grade wet and dry papers to refine the finish and bring the part to a suitable lustre. I've deliberately not polished up the part beyond the level I believe the original to have been when new. 
The replacement part is complete for now, but at a later stage I will drill the pivot hole and fit the escapement, making any adjustments to the pallets that may be required. Then finally the part will be handed over to the engraver to be hand engraved with a pattern in keeping with other original parts of the clock. I do hope you enjoyed this little insight into my horological world and will consider liking the, the video with a thumbs up click to show your support. Better still, please leave a comment below and let me know if you enjoyed the video and what you would like to see more of in the future. If you've not already then please do subscribe to my channel so that you never miss a video and help the channel to grow. And lastly, please share this video with all your friends. Thank you so much for your support. See you in the next video.